Okay, now that we've mentioned a bit about population sizes, let's get into allele frequencies because each of those individuals has two copies of an allele for every given gene and we want to take a look at those. Okay. So here's our gene pool of a diploid group. We're mainly going to be working with diploids here of a population over generations and over time it appears this uh, one of the alleles fades, disappears. That's change in the gene pool of a population over time that is basically what it comes down to is evolution, right? So we've got our population, our group of individuals that belong to the same species, that live in a defined geographic area and actually potentially interbreed. That's our, going to be our working definition of population. So does a well-adapted population have high or low genetic diversity? Well, it depends what well-adapted means. Uh, we've got different methods that we could test this particular question, but it really is up to um, the particulars of that um, situation. So we've got our population that's a group of 2N individuals, each individual carrying two alleles for each gene. So there's a discrete number of copies of each allele within the population, okay? And that is our gene pool, is the genetic information carried by members of a population. So here's our allele. This could also be a haplotype, but we're not going to get too much into that. Frequency is in a gene pool, okay? So you would count or compute the frequency of each allele in that population, uh, maybe from gamete sampling. You could take a bunch of... Um, uh, eggs or sperm from a individual and um, sample those uh, over time. You could do microwave arrays, you could sequence other estimates, but you can come around to get a, a frequency of how many are in the gene pool. In this case, we've got 70 out of 100 alleles are blue and 30 out of 100 alleles are yellow. So and then we're saying the blue are the dominants here because they're going to go into P and the yellows are the recessive alleles. We're going to mainly be working with straight up like recessive dominant relationships here too. We're not going to get into co-dominance or incomplete dominance. It's just recessive or dominant. So if we've got our allele frequency, uh, so our 0 0.7 or 0 0.3, and we just let everybody randomly assort, okay, and pop together, uh, frequencies will be the product of the allele frequencies. I'm going to break this down super slow in a little bit, so don't freak out. But if there was nothing shenanigany going on, everything would match up perfectly, and we could just do a quick, simple equation, and it would pop out correctly. Okay. So this is, by the way, where we get the two and the two pq is because of this. Uh, we're combining these two frequencies together. Remember our um, product rule: the frequency. You know, if two things happen together, you multiply them, and that gives you the chance that they both happen. Hmm. Here we go. So under certain conditions, allele and genotype frequency don't change. Like if you just have a super stable, nothing interesting going on population with nothing occurring, no immigration, no immigration, no natural selection. Hey, this is sounding like Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. It is. You don't have any changes. The population just keeps shuffling genes together. Everybody's breeding. There's no sexual selection. There's nothing. Just shuffle, shuffle like a deck of cards and you get the same thing every generation. Okay. So this is when nothing exciting is going on, aka no evolution is going on. Your allele frequencies, frequencies don't change. So when do allele or genotype frequencies remain at equilibrium or what factors change allele and genotype frequencies in a population. Well, hey, look, the assumptions for Hardy-Weinberg right here. So uh, in order for nothing to happen, mating is to be random, no mutation, no migration, extremely large population, no differential reproduction. A violation or a source of change where ev evolving is happening is you have non-random assortive mating, mutation, migration, genetic drift, and selection working on your population, okay? So this is the um, basic, these are the five major um, claims of, of Hardy-Weinberg, which I hope you remember from GenBio because we're going to be going with that for a while. Okay. So how do we actually determine that there's been a change in the gene pool? Okay. So we're going to use mathematical models to describe our process using an equation. Variables are factors that shift this process, and models are usually some sort of simplification. They're trying to simulate a process to make a prediction. So they always write, no, that's the point. It's just modeling. You're trying to get an estimate, an idea. So first things first, let's go over how to get 
allele genotype free. We're going to use frequency a lot. We're going to use frequency all over the place. Okay, frequency in this case, it's a proportion. It's the number out of from zero to one, how many, right? So if this was a percentage, it'd be out of a hundred. So we'd say 85% of students uh, love being at ESF. Uh, proportion of frequency is out of one. So you say 0.85, you know, out of this this proportion enjoy being in ESF. So we're going to be using the decimal form. We're not even going to play with percentages, uh, kind of like we did before with um, phenotype and stuff. When we did the Punnett squares, we talked about how many percent of you know black lab puppies are yellow. Uh, for this, we're going to just stay in decimal form. We're not ever going to use percentages. So how many individuals have a particular genotype? You can infer some of that. We did for the cats. You could look at the phenotype and infer the uh, genotype. That works occasionally. In a question, I may even just give you the genotypes. We'll assume that somebody went out and genotyped a whole bunch of samples. Okay. And then once you have your idea of how many there were, you divide by the total population and get frequency. That's it. It's just the just like if there were. Um, there's two orange kittens in this pile of one, you know, 11 kittens, and I could take two divided by that, and that would give me my frequency. So for genotypes, okay, we're going to be working with diploids, and so we're going to have three main genotypes. We're going to have the homozygous dominant, yoink, in which case you take the number of homozygous dominant individuals and divide by the total. Okay, and that gets you your frequency. This is also known as p squared. We'll keep that in mind. Okay. We've got our frequency of heterozygotes. Okay, so you take your number of individuals and divide by the total. And that is going to equal 2pq. That'll be interesting later on. And then finally, we've got our homozygous recessives. So the number of those will get us q squared. This is really critical. This might be the only phenotype like hint we have, or if we only have phenotypes, it'll be, well, I guess we know the number of homozygous uh, recessive due to the recessive phenotype, but so that'll be useful later on. Okay. So if I've got uh, 12 homozygous dominant, 15 heterozygous, and seven homozygous recessive in my population, I've got 34 people, and all I have to do is divide by how many there are divided by the total. So uh, for homozygous dominant, we've got 0.35. For heterozygous, we've got 0.44. And for homozygous, we've got 0.21, and that should be a small a in the purple. And so this should add up to 1. Yay, it does. Good. Okay. Now, instead of genotypes, we want to look at the frequency of alleles. And we can easily pull this out of our genotype information. This is more informative than genotypes. The genotypes are just kind of a temporary assemblage of alleles in a sexually reproducing population. But we want to get, so every generation, the genotypes are broken down into alleles. You get the law of independent assortment and who's getting with who. And they're reorganized into a new mix. So, but types and numbers of alleles have more continuity from one generation to another. That's the literal, the gene pool is how many alleles are present. And so that is why we want to look at allele frequencies. Usually you want to break everything down to the alleles. So we're going to need to calculate those and convert those, uh, which you're literally going to count the alleles in population and divide by the total number of alleles, which if we're in a diploid population should be two times the number of individuals. Each individual has two. Okay. So we use our genotypes. They're a little easier to count and infer allele at frequency. Uh, can we use phenotypes? Why or why not? I mean, we, we could know the frequency of the homozygous recessive, but then we'd have to like use our Hardy-Weinberg model to project the number of the other genotypes, which we will do. But um, we, if we just have phenotype information, we can never really know how many of the homozygous dominants or heterozygotes are there. So it gets a little tricky, but we'll go into that. So calculating the allele frequencies. Let's take our another population, the same population again. We had our 34 people, and they break down as so. So we've got 34 people, but we have 68 total alleles, you know, one on each chromosome. So in the 12 homozygous dominant, we actually have 24 um, dominant alleles and zero recessive alleles. In the 15 heterozygotes, we have 15 of the dominant alleles and 15 of the recessive. And then in the seven um, homozygous recessive, we have 
no dominant alleles, but we have 14 of the recessive alleles. Okay. So total for our dominant is we have 39 alleles, and then we divide that by the total number of alleles, 68 now, and that gets us our 0.57. That's our proportion of dominant alleles. Well, what about little a? Uh, well, we can add those up. So that was 15 plus 14, so 29. 29 out of 68 is 0.43. We should definitely check to make sure our P and Q, hey, wait, we just calculated P and Q, yes we did, equals one. We could also only do that once and find the inverse. Once we knew the 0 0.57, we just subtract that from one and that gets us the proportion of our frequency of the recessive alleles, okay? So this is where we get into the Hardy-Weinberg law. So this is describing our allele frequencies in the top part. The P is the frequency of our dominant allele. The Q is the frequency of our recessive allele. And we can look at the genotype frequencies, the way in which our um, alleles are assembling into genotypes in our ideal population. So our P squared is the frequency of an individual that got two copies of the dominant allele. The Q squared is the frequency of individuals that get two copies of the recessive allele. And then 2PQ is the frequency of individuals that got one of the dominant and one of the recessive alleles. So in Hardy-Weinberg for this to work and work properly, the population has to be infinitely large, there's random mating, no selection, no mutation, no migration, discrete generations, no overlapping, equal uh, breeding between the sexes and equal amounts between the sexes. Basically, if no mechanisms of evolution are going on, right, currently, there won't be a big deviation between these. Your allele frequencies, when you plug them into these, into the genotype, you'll see that the genotype matches what you found, or it'll be only slightly off, and there's not a huge you know, pressure occurring at the moment. Okay? So this is the idea behind Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, that two alleles at a given locus result in predicted genotype frequencies. Okay? Now this doesn't mean that if you do this for one gene and nothing's happening, you say that that population is not evolving. Yeah. That population is only not evolving at that particular gene you're looking at. Could be something could be going totally on in fur color, but you're looking at like, you know, ATPase. It's not changing. <laughs> like there is, it is just staying the same. Uh, then you have to look at a bunch of different genes and low science stuff to see what's going on in a particular population at a given time. So here's our P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared plus one. So if they're both roughly equal, the number of allele frequencies in population, you're going to see something like this. This looks like a Punnett square. Well, yeah, it is, because we've got our frequency. This is if we did this for a whole bunch of individuals instead, just one. We've got a frequency of the P allele here and the frequency of the Q allele over here. Mm -hmm. And we would find in our population, we would roughly see, um, where'd my mouse go? My mouse disappeared. Let me pick a stronger color there. That roughly you know, out of our population, we'd see about three quarters having this particular phenotype. And uh, da, 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 da. because if we're looking at egg and sperm, we've got a 50% chance, right, of, of whichever of these going because we've just got the two. Uh, that's a 50%. Very good job, me. You're doing great today. Okay. But if we're talking about a population, okay, this could skew. What if the allele frequency is 0.7 for the dominant allele and 0.3 for the recessive allele? Our, uh, our Punnett square changes. It gets a little bigger on one side, a little smaller on the other side, and we see this starting to move around. Okay. So we're going to take these alleles and take a look. So if we're given allele frequencies, we could find the gene types if we predict what the gene types would be if this population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So if our frequency of that dominant allele is 0.7, well, over here we get to a little bit bigger, right? And then what's the frequency of the um, recessive allele? We can do the 1 minus P equals Q uh, is 0.3. So then we could look at each particular, um, so here, how many p squareds are there, okay? So it's the chance, our 0 0.7 times our 0 0.7 gives us 0 0.49, okay? 
and because we're adding the combination, what is the what is the probability that these two things will happen together? Okay, what about the heterozygote? Well, there's two because you you literally have a block over here and a block over here of what happens when you have p and q getting together, and then this p and this q getting together. So we multiply 2 times 0.7 times 0.3, and the chances of that happening is 0 0.42. Okay, and then finally, marker, um, we've got our little chance down here of getting uh, just the, the each of the recessives. Again, so this is the 0.3 here times 0.3. Oh, hey, 0.3 squared. So that gets us our 0 0.9. Okay. So this is where Hardy-Weinberg is relating right back to Punnett squares and showing how this uh, all comes together. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. We add those all up just to double check. Frequency of our three genotypes equal to one. Good. We're good. So what this is is a prediction of expected genotype values if we're in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Could be different. We could have way more heterozygotes then this, uh, it could be off. We could have maybe there's a lethal allele, so we basically see none of the uh, homozygous recessive. It can get modified, all right? But this is our good model. This is our good baseline that we can now compare things to and say whether or not it's different. What about excellent genes? Oof. Well, yeah, we, could go, we can go through and count this. We can count how many alleles there are. So females have uh, two alleles if it's an excellent trait, right? But males are hemizygous and they only have one allele. And so for men, genotypic frequency is the same as the allele frequency if it's an X-linked gene. So let's do this real quick. So if we got total alleles on X, uh, there are, we've got 48, but we have to count them twice because there are two. And then for males, we only count once. So there's our 48, two times 48 plus 27. So we have 123 alleles on the X chromosome there. And then if we want to look at the frequency of the X big A, okay, We've got, look at these two up here. There's 12 of those times two, so there's our two times 12. And then we've got 27 there. And then down in the men, there's 14 guys that have one copy each, so there's the 14. Add that up, divide by 123, and we get 0 0.53. Okay. And then next, if we want to count up the recessive allele on the X chromosome there, we can go back up to, the, we can find this one here. We've just got the 27 in the heterozygotes. There's that. And then for the homozygous recessive in the females, they've got two copies each, so we'll do two times the nine. Then men only have one copy, so there's our 13. Add that all up, divide by the total number of alleles, so we get 0 0.47. Should still add up to one if we add those together. Yay, it does. So we can totally get allele frequencies out of um, X-linked genes. What about multiple alleles? Ooh. All right. Yeah, we can go through and count these too. Uh, in this case, we've got six genotypes. Now that we're looking at three alleles, we've got some blood groups going on. So all we have to do is count the number of A's, B's, and O's. Uh, so let's look at the population. We're not dealing with sex links, so we just have 123 individuals multiplied by two because they each have two copies. So we've got 246 alleles. Okay. And then, so there's our frequency of A. All right, we'll go through this. So let's take a look. Um, let me get a, what I can you see? Okay, so here's A. So there's one A up here in the ABs, so that gets us five. Then we go to the, whoever has these, the genotype with two A's, so there's 12 of those people, so we're going to multiply that by two because that's 24 alleles total. And there's some of the AOs here, but just uh, 19 of those. Add up, divide by 246, and we get 0.2. Next, let's count up the Bs. We've got in our AB genotype up here, we've got five of those B alleles. In the BB, if you have two copies, that's 14 people, so we have to multiply that by two for each allele. And then the BO, we've got 22 of those alleles. Multiply up, divide by the total, we got 0 0.22. Okay. And then finally, for the O's, what we could do, we could take this plus this and go 1 minus 0.42. I don't know why it's doing that. And get 158, but let's go through it just in case. So we've got for our O's, 
We have our AO up here that gets us 19 O alleles. We've got the BOs that gives us another 22 O alleles. And then we have a whopping 51 people with the OO genotype. So we're going to multiply that by 2, divide by 246, and then we get our 0 0.58. There we go. We've got allele frequencies, and they all add up to 1. Okay, all three of them. So with this information, we could take it a step further. Okay, here's our three allele case, and this is if we do a kind of fun looking Punnett square of the proportions of each of these alleles, you could go and figure out what the genotypes would be if they were in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And so you can calculate it right on out. Uh, and we're gonna, so it'll, so like here, P squared is still gonna be um, the frequency of the homozygous dominant. Q squared is gonna be the frequency of those two alleles together. And the C squared would be the R squared in this case would be the frequency of that last one there. Okay. So if these were our allele frequencies, I gave some new and different ones up here. Can we determine genotype frequencies? Absolutely. There's still just two alleles per genotype. Okay. The next allele frequency becomes R. If we want to forward become S, that's getting a little insane. Okay. So now our allele frequency, like we saw before, is P plus Q plus R equals one. So it looks a little crazy. It's okay. We've just got our two. Here's our um, first gene that has our first alleles, two of each copy, two of this copy and two of this copy. And then we've got three different kinds of heterozygotes. Okay. And so we've got the ones with 2PQ, 2PR, or 2QR. Right. So it'll just depend what, I, what you ask for. Uh, you could then calculate out. So what about the frequency of a, B blood type. Well, that's the frequency of, so that's going to be our um, 2, P, whatever. So we got 2 times the frequency of A times the frequency of B. So that's our 2 times 0 0.40, which we grab from up here, times 0 0.12. Oh, there we go. Frequency of A, B blood types in this population. Okay, Not too horrific. What about if it's the um, uh, a homozygote? Okay, in this case it's a, a recessive, but it doesn't matter. The frequency of this particular one is going to be that frequency of just the allele frequency squared. Go up and grab 0 0.48, and we'll square it. And our frequency for this particular genotype is now 0 0.23. We could go on, we could do a four allele case. In this case, it would just be very slowly picking and counting the alleles, and then you just combine the frequencies together the same sort of way. Um, again, you're working, this is a, with a two, this is a two N system, okay? Each individual is still only getting two alleles. So it's not gonna get any bigger than, you know, um, P squared, R squared, or Q squared, R squared, S squared. It's, and then you have the 2PS, 2QS, and all that. Now it's getting tricky. <laughs> Could we do this in tetraploid organisms? I'm not going to be evil enough to ask you, but I do want to explain it. So allele frequency is basically P plus Q to the first power, which is 1. 1 equals P plus Q, right? Because you're looking at just one allele. When you get to diploid genotype frequencies, we're upping this to the second power. There's two possibilities, right? So we get our 2p plus q squared equals 1. Hey, that's a binomial. If we opened up that binomial, as per you know, calculus and all the good stuff, or actually it would be the, um, you have the two next to each other, you do the inside, outside, together, and all that good stuff, um, then you get the p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. Right? So that's the second power, the binomial. If for tetraploid, you would up this up to p plus q to the fourth power. Okay, what this looks like is you have a genotype that has four alleles in each. And so you would calculate it out as this particular, um, you know, so this is just a whole lot of binomials. There are things stacking together, so it's possible. You could do it. Um, it just means a little more fancy math and a lot more square roots and um, cube roots. And yeah, it gets fun. Totally doable. So we could do chi-square tests 
on how many alleles or genotypes or phenotypes are in a population or how population matches up with itself. If it's a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, you thought you saw the last of chi-square tests. Nah. Carl Pearson, the father of modern statistics, founded the first college statistics in London, hypothesis testing. Thank him. P-values, Pearson, chi-square test. We don't we just call them chi-square tests. Uh, the correlation coefficient, precursor to basically all linear models, histograms and principal component analysis, huge guy in stats. He was a passionate eugenicist, opposed Jewish immigration to Britain before World War II, and said really nasty things about Jewish people. Go figure. All like the you know people who do great things end up being well, not all of them, but a whole bunch of them end up being pretty crap. Go figure. So. We're still using the chi-square test. Just wanted you to know about him. So chi-square relies on observed counts, right? You have to compare populations. Counts. How many Labrador retriever puppies in this offspring pile? Uh, you cannot do chi-squares on the P and Q values. You cannot do this on the frequencies. If you were doing a chi-square on decimals, stop it. No, you cannot do that. Don't. Okay? Chi-squares must be done on counts, on whole numbers. You cannot do them on decimals. You must convert the frequency somehow back into a count, like an expected count, just like we did for puppies and things. We didn't just put percentages or whatever. We put actually made into an expected population. Okay, So you can use your allele frequencies to make predictions about what population genotypes should be in Hardy and Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, so this is the first of the two kinds of squared chi-square tests we're going to do. The chi-square goodness of fit test. We've got our, we got to start with genotypes. We start with our genotype frequency and observed population. We convert that to the allele frequency and observed population. It's still there, it's still there. We just counted them all up. Okay, now we know the alleles. Then we take those allele frequencies and plug them into the p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. That gets us the expected genotype frequency if the population is in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. And then we do a chi-square goodness of fit to see if these match up. Okay. So let's do this in a human population. Let's look at CCR5. CCR5 is actually the gene that the uh, scientist in China a couple years back modified in human embryos, trying to make a deletion because there is a deletion, this delta 32, which um, most people are susceptible to HIV-1. If you have one copy of this deletion, you're susceptible, but you're, if you get AIDS, it progresses much more slowly. And then if you have two copies of mutation, you are actually resistant to most strains of HIV. Okay, This is a naturally occurring mutation common in Eastern Europe. It just so happens. The guy in China tried to duplicate this, but he actually screwed up and he made like a delta a five base pair deletion, an 18 base pair deletion, not in the intron four, and he just totally messed up their genes and he's a terrible person. So, but this is an interesting um, gene that's definitely under study for how exactly does this particular deletion make you resistant to HIV. Yeah. So let's look at a group. Let's look at this population. Is this population, these 100 people here, in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium for this gene locus? So do the genotypes, these 79, um, we're going to say it's a dominant genotype. It doesn't, the two A's, the two regular copies of CCR5, uh, people with one of the 32 bit deletions and one person with the two copies of the deletion here. This is match what we'd see. And if we take their allele frequencies, plug and chug them through Hardy Weinberg and pop them out the other side. Okay. So first we need to count alleles. Okay. So for the, we're going to call it regular allele. In, the, in these individuals, the 79 people have two copies. So we've got 150 alleles. Uh, we get 20 out of the heterozygotes, and there are no alleles of the um, normal gene in, the, in, the, in that particular gene type. Okay. So that gives 178 of the A alleles. And then for the delta 32 alleles, there's none of those in the 2A genotype. There are 20 copies in the heterozygotes. And there are just two copies in the one little homozygous group there. Okay, so we've got 22 of the delta 32s. And that adds up to 200 alleles. If we had 100 individuals, now we're looking at 200 alleles. And I'm coding everything in dark red for the actual frequencies. So given the actual gene type frequencies, we calculated the actual 
allele frequencies. So what we do for, for, the, for A, for our normal gene, is 178 divided by 200, so 0.89 is P. Done. The frequency of the delta 32 gene, 22 divided by 200, gives us 0.11. That's Q. Yay. Good. We're on the right track. Okay. Hey, look, P plus Q equals 1. Always check. Always check. If it's not, you done fucked up, go back and try again. All right. So we've got our two frequencies, our P and Q, for each of our alleles. Actual allele frequencies. Now we're going to take Hardy-Weinberg here, the longer one, to predict genotypic frequencies if they are in Hardy-Weinberg. So we plug and chuck. We put in our, to find the frequency of the homozygous A genotype, we square uh, 0.89. That should be squared 0.792. We, so that's this one right here. For the uh, heterozygote, we do 2PQ, so 2 times that, 0.096. And for our homozygous delta 32 here, we square that and we get a very small number there. Okay. Now we've got our predicted genotype frequencies. Yay, you're expected. Okay. So now, can we plug in those decimals? No, you may not plug in those decimals. We need to make an expected population. We're going to bring that back out into a count, a population count to see if the genotype frequencies are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So given our expected genotype frequencies, we're going to use the actual total population to calculate what the expected genotype count would be for that many individuals. So here's our frequencies. Our population is 100. Okay. So we would multiply by that. We expect to see 0.792 times 100, 79.2 of those, 19.6 of those, and 1.2 of those. Okay, so we're just converting into a count. This is a count. Count. You must do this. If you don't do it, you're wrong. Okay. All right, so now we've got a count. Basically, this is a made up population. Okay relative to the genotype frequencies, which we're going to test against in a chi-square test. We're going to make a fake little made-up population. Yeah. So here's our actual individuals from the very beginning. Okay. And now we have some expected individuals that we kind of massaged out of the uh, genotype frequencies, right? Offhand, they look rather similar. Yeah. Now we're going to perform a chi-square test. Goodness of fit between the actual and the expected. Okay, observed and expected. That sounds about right. So there's our three genotypes. There's our observed. Let's pop in our expected. And then we go into Excel and we ask it very nicely to do the observed minus expected squared divided by the expected for each of those three. And then we count them up and we get 0 0.042. As our chi-square, can we say anything about this yet or do we have to go get a... Ah, we gotta check our degrees of freedom. And let's say that alpha equals 0 0.05, which it always is if it's never stated otherwise in this course. Okay, and that lets us get our critical value of 5.99. And I do dare say that our 0 0.42 is under the critical value. There's a very small difference between our observed and expected populations. So our actual gene typic frequency match predicted this meeting, which means this population, not all populations, this population genotype for this gene is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. We do not want to fall into the trap of extrapolating too far out. If you only sampled vernal pools in central New York, all you can make your conclusions about are vernal pools in central New York. You can't talk about all of New York State or all the Northeast or anything. You have to stick to what you looked at. So this is our, this population's genotypes for this gene are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So here's a plot, okay? So this is the idea of in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, as you move along one of these, if you move up and down genotype frequencies, your alleles move along the curve, your Q goes up and then your P goes P goes down and P goes up, and the genotypes actually kind of slide along these, these graphs here. So the cool thing is when, boom, oh man, our heterozygotes 
are at like 0.9. That should never happen. What's going on? Okay, so there we're starting to see when we get off these lines, interesting things are happening. Mutation, selection, pressure, migration, okay, is pulling us out of this lovely little model. So when you're out of equilibrium, you got mutations, small populations subject to some genetic drift, breeding with other populations, gene flows coming in and moving things around, natural selection, non-random mating. So we've got heterozygote advantage or disadvantage, group kin, kin selection, just changing allelic genotypic frequencies as some phenotypes are selected for or modified or changed, which we'll talk about in the next chunk, but we're going to do a couple of chi-squares first. This last one. So the chi-square test of independence. We did goodness of fit. We we're comparing a population basically to a made up version of itself. In this case, we're looking at population one over here, these, you know, loop tailed mink. And we've got loop tailed mink over in a separate population that are not interbreeding. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Maybe we'll test that. And we want to do a chi square test of independence to see if there's a significant difference between them. So we could do this in phenotypes. Okay. We could do this with genotypes. We could literally even do this with alleles, okay? So again, we're testing the counts of these populations. Probably should change the slide. We're testing the counts, but we're looking at whether or not the populations are similar to each other or dissimilar for particular genes at a particular point in time. We could also look at population before and after a certain time. It'd be like in 1980 this, and 1990 this. Wow. I'm dating myself, uh, have they changed substantially in that time? So walking through the forest, we find a large population of toadstools, which you don't eat because we don't eat things that are out in the woods unless you have, I don't know, been Tom Horton's apprentice for like 10 years, okay? Uh, we know that the allele for being spotted is dominant for the allele being plain. And in this population of 250 toadstools, because you check every single one, you find 14 toadstools that are not spotted. What are the allele frequencies? Hmm. That's not enough information. The only thing we really know for sure is how many recessive individuals there are in the population, how many genotype little s, little s, and that's 14 out of 250. We're going to use Hardy-Weinberg to fill in the missing values. We're going to just assume that, okay? If you don't have what you need, we're going to use Hardy Weinberg to give us a model to figure it out. Okay. It might also say in the question, like, what are the allele frequencies if this is in Hardy Weinberg? But if it's not in there, use Hardy Weinberg to fill it in. Hey, Hardy Weinberg, you should almost like tattoo that on the inside of your wrist or something, the various goodness of, of that. Yeah, I'm just saying, you might really want that handy. You know how to use it. You should really look at the, um, uh, practice packets that I put on Blackboard because, boy, you want to be an expert at this. So we've got 250 toadstools, 14 have the recessive phenotype. And if we know the proportion of recessive individuals, we know the frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype. Okay. So 14 out of 250 equals 0.056 equals Q squared. Cool. If we know Q squared, then we can know Q. That's the frequency of just the allele itself. Okay, that's the square root of Q squared. So I guess 0.237 equals Q. Okay. If we know Q, we can know P, the frequency of the dominant allele, because that's 1 minus Q will equal P. Right? Great. So the question was, what are the allele frequencies? And blam, we got them. Great. Yay, we're done. You would very clearly label 0.23. So you would, you would make this super clear so I can tell what you're doing. And then we could go farther from P and Q. We can also get the frequency of the homozygous dominant and of the heterozygote using that handy formula. So we can 0.5A, 0.362. Yay, we could get all the information. I personally am a fan of getting all the information out and being like, okay, what do I need? This and this. Great, cool. Make sure it's all very clear. So the next weekend you go to Oakwood Cemetery and you find a larger population of toadstools. Okay. And through somehow somebody lets you do genetic testing on that many samples, poor you, you determine there are 300 homozygous spotted, 200 heterozygous also spotted, and 50 homozygous plain, the recessive toadstools. So what are the allele frequencies of this second Oakwood population? Okay. So our total population, 550 individuals, that gets us 1,100 alleles. Right. So we can count up. 
we've got 300 homozygous dominant, and that gets us 600 dominant alleles. In our heterozygotes, we've got 200 of each, 200 uh, dominant and 200 recessive. And then finally, we've got 50 recessive left, and that gets us 100 uh, alleles. So we can count that up. The frequency of the dominant allele is 800 divided by 1100, and that gets us 0.727. And then we could just do you know, one minus that and get the other one, but if we want to be ballsy about it, we can do frequency of the recessive allele is 300 divided by 1100, and that gets us 0.273. Hey, look, they both equal one. Excellent, we're on the track. There are the allele frequencies of the second population. So perform a test of independence on these toadstool phenotypes to see if the populations are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium for this love sign. Hmm. So population one, we had 14 plain, and we could subtract that from the total and find that there were 236 spotted mushrooms. Cool, total 250. Population two, we had uh, 500 spotted because we could add those two genotypes together. We had 50 plain, and the total was 550. One huge basic rule about chi-squares is that the populations have to be the same. The populations, ah, we can't do it. No, just kidding, we can. We will standardize the numbers to the smaller population. We're going to take that 550 and kind of just like, loop, what would it be at 250 so we can compare these. Um, we're not losing any information we compress. If we took the 250 and tried to expand to 550, eh, you don't want to like add information that you're not sure about. It's always safer to just compress what you have. So what would the larger population be if we scaled to 250? So again, we're going to kind of make like a made up population just to fit things at the right ratio, but that way we're comparing the same number of individuals. So we take our 500 divided by 550, get that ratio times 250, and that gets us 227.3 decimal. That's decimal is fine. And then we've got 50 divided by 550 times 250 is 22.7. So we just took our like, you know, 500 to 50 and to 227 to 227. Okay, so now we're at a total of 250. We'll use that. Okay. So here's our phenotypes. We've got spotted and plain. We got our population one, which fits in nicely, 236 and 14, total 250. And now our population two, 227.3 to 22.7, scaled to 250. And we can do our chi square on it, which we get 3.667 being our chi squared. Now, degrees of freedom, we got two categories, so two minus one is one, and our critical value is 3.84. We just squeaked under that. Small difference, close. Not close enough. Are these two populations statistically genetically similar or dissimilar for this particular gene? No. Population one and two are not statistically significantly different for the toadstool spotting gene. So this is our test of independence. Are these two? Maybe they are breeding together. They're not independent, so it seems. It could be, you know, alpha equals 0.05%. Could be a little off, possibly, very low chance. Or maybe there's mating, there's gene flow going along. They're pretty genetically similar. It would be interesting to see what the like, how far the spores travel, and that could be like an ecological problem where it's like, are you know, how far away do you have to get from a population to see when there's an actual like genetic difference between populations of fungi? Fungi rule the world. They own everything. We're all, you know, you cannot kill them in any way that matters. So. so going on to that, the idea that over time alleles might disappear completely. Um, just a couple definitions here. Fixation is a change in the G pool uh, from a situation where there were two variants of a particular gene, so two alleles or more, and you've gone to a situation where only one of those alleles remain. That allele has gotten fixed into the population. There is no other option. Okay. So they actually did this um, by uh, an experiment where they were able to induce gene fixation by basically drowning fields, and they were able to get rid of at least one mutation just never occurred again. Like they literally wiped it out of the population based on um, this drowning technique. In a perfect world, all alleles would assort independently from each other. However, genes are linked. Remember linkage? Hmm. So genetic hitchhiking is when an allele at one locus rises to a high frequency, not because it's being selected for, not because it's particularly great or anything, but it's linked 
to an allele that is under very high selection that's right near it on the on the chromosome okay it just it's along for the ride <laughs> i like the term and then another terminology we use frequently is called selective sweep so a very very rare allele that increases the fitness of the carrier relative to everybody else increases rapidly in frequency due to natural selection. Like something is just too good not to have. Like that one person just had a bunch of kids and they did great and then those kids had more and they did even better and everything just really went into, so maybe not fixed, not all the way to fix, but definitely just a very large increase in a very short amount of time. Uh, Toxoplasma gondii is this one um, parasite of mammals and it, there's apparently a couple evolutionary spots where it just, you know, bamfed out into, and there was a selective sweep. We don't see any of the other kinds anymore. Uh, this has happened in humans for uh, lactase permanence, where lactase is, is um, generated throughout your life as opposed to just for when you're a baby, and also adaptations to uh, high altitudes. If your troop moved up there and you could tolerate high altitude better than anybody else, you did a lot better. And so that, that happened in our evolutionary history.